الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا تجعلوا دعاء الرسول بينكم كدعاء بعضكم بعضا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There is no doubt that Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam is a unique personality. In fact, there is no one in the history of Islam and in fact in the history of humanity that can be compared to her. And you find that. The ayah that I recited is an interesting verse from Surah An-Nur, Surah 24, ayah number 63, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially admonishes the Muslims, the companions of the Prophet, for not observing proper decorum in their interaction with the Prophet. You know, brothers and sisters, Rasulullah was so humble and so down to earth that many people became too comfortable around him. And when you become too comfortable around someone, you, you kind of, you fail to observe some of the necessary formalities, the important etiquettes. You find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse he says, لا تجعلوا دعاء الرسول بينكم كدعاء بعضكم بعضا Don't call upon the Prophet. Don't speak to the Prophet in the same way that you speak to each other. You know, many of them, they started to call the Prophet by his first name. So when they would sit with the Prophet, they would say, Ya Muhammad, in fact, one of the reasons why Surah Al-Hujurat, Surah 49 was revealed was because some of the companions, they would stand outside of the door of the Prophet and the Prophet's house was adjacent to the masjid and they would shout, Ya Muhammad, Ya Muhammad, Ukhruj ilayna, come out, O Muhammad, come out. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervenes. And in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تجعلوا دعاء الرسول بينكم كدعاء بعضكم بعضا. Don't call upon the Prophet in the same way that you call upon each other. You call, each, you call upon each other using your first names. But don't speak to the Prophet like this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this ayah. Now, of course, Fatima to Zahra, when this ayah is revealed, she hears this ayah and she reports after the revelation of this ayah, she says, Hib to Rasulullah and Aqula lahu ya abati. Fatima to Zahra, when this ayah was revealed, where essentially Allah is saying, so the Muslims, that if you want to address the Prophet, you have to address him as the Messenger of God. When you want to speak to him, you have to have adab, you have to have akhlaq, you have to address him properly and respectfully. You have to say, Ya Rasulullah, if you want to address him. Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, she says that when this ayah was revealed, I was too embarrassed to call upon the Prophet by saying, Oh my Father. So she says, فَكُنْتُ أَقُولُ So I started to say, Ya Rasulullah. Fatima to Zahra, it's her father. But she started to address him formally by addressing him as, O oh Messenger of Allah. فَأَعْرَضَ عَنِّي مَرَّةً أَوْ إِثْنَتَيْنَ أَوْ ثَلَاثَةً Fatima to Zahra, she says that when I started to call upon the Prophet in this formal way, the Prophet ignored me once, 
twice. Three times, Fatima Tuzara kept on saying, Ya Rasulullah, she was insisting on addressing him using this honorific title until the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi comes to her. She says, Thumma Aqbal Ali. She says, I was calling him, Ya Rasulullah, and then the Prophet, he came to me. فَقَالَ يَا فَاطِمَ إِنَّهَا لَمْ تَنْزَلْ فِيكِ وَلَا فِي أَهْلِكِ O Fatima, this ayah was not revealed about you, nor was it revealed about your family. وَلَا فِي نَسْلِكِ And this was not revealed about Hassan and Hussein. This was revealed about who? He says to her, Enti minni wa ana minki, you're a part of me. You're not a stranger. Innama nazalat fi ahli jifa'i wal ghirza min Quraysh. This ayah was revealed to admonish those who are disrespectful, those who have bad character among the tribe of Quraysh. So who? Who is this ayah speaking about? About kuffar? No, Allah doesn't have to tell kuffar that, you know, don't call him Muhammad, call him Rasulullah. It's talking about who? The companions of the Prophet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so the Prophet says to her that this ayah is not about you. This is an admonishment against those who don't observe proper etiquette with the Prophet. And then Rasulullah tells her, Ya Abati. O Fatima, when you call upon me, say, O oh my beloved father. This is how I want you to address me. Because hearing this from you revives my heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased when you call upon me by saying, O oh my beloved father. So you see that Fatima to Zahra is always set apart. Oftentimes a ruling that applies to the wider community, you see Fatima to Zahra is an exception. When Rasulullah closed all of the doors, because many of the companions, they had apartments that would open up into the masjid, the Prophet announced that all of those doors have to be closed. They cannot remain open because many of them would not be in a state of Bahara, they would be in a state of Janaba. All of the doors were closed except the door of Ali and Fatima. That door was always allowed to be, to be opened. Now, when you look at the life of Lady Fatima alayhi salam, so we know that Fatima to Zahra was born five years after the Ba'tha. So she came into this world five years after the Prophet began his prophetic mission. So she came into this world at a time when the Prophet was facing severe opposition. And as you know, she loses her mother when she's about seven or eight years old. When her mother Khadija passes away, the narrations say that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, shortly after, he marries Umm Salama. So Fatima to Zara is a young girl. Rasulullah marries Umm Salama. Now what's interesting is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he tells Umm Salama, who's an older woman, a very pious woman, he entrusts Fatima to her. He says to her that I want you to look after Fatima. She's an orphan, she's a young child. I want you to take care of her. Umm Salama, she says, I swear by Allah that I found this little girl the daughter of the Prophet, to be more courteous and more knowledgeable than me in all affairs at this young age. You know, many of us were familiar with the famous hadith of the Prophet where he says, Fatima Ummu Abiha, that Fatima is the mother 
of her father. When did the Prophet say this? Do you know when the Prophet uttered these words? When Fatima to Zahra was maybe six or seven years old. This was during the Shi'ab of Abi Talib, when the Muslim community was boycotted and they were living in isolation and the Muslims were literally starving. The Meccans were prohibited from selling anything to them. So they were, they were living in the, the mountains. They were isolated. There was barely any food. They were living a very meager, basic life. And you imagine, imagine any six-year-old girl in that condition. Any child would complain. Any child would need to be taken care of. But not only did Fatima, not only was she patient, she was the one who was comforting Rasulullah She was caring for him. She was one of the ones who would stay awake at night and made sure that her father slept. She would make sure that her father had food to eat. She looked after the Prophet at the age of six in the same way that a mother would look after her child. She was selfless, even at that young age. She really had that, that generous soul that her mother Khadija had. And the similarities between the Prophet and Lady Fatima are truly amazing. So much so that even Aisha, you know, who's not you know, the closest person to the family of the Prophet, you know, Aisha herself, she says, "Ma ra'aytu ahadan ashbahu samtan bi Rasulillah fi qiyamha wa qu'udha min Fatima." Aisha, she says that I swear that I have not seen anyone resemble the Prophet in his character and even in the way that he would sit and he would stand more than Fatima. She was one of those individuals who described the way that Fatima walked when she went to the masjid to deliver her fiery sermon, Al-Khutbah Al-Fadakiyah, Ma takhrumu mishyatuha mishyata abiha Rasulillah. That when they saw Fatima walking, Aisha even says, says that she reminded us of the way that the Prophet would walk. That she imitated every motion of the Prophet. She was a female version of the Prophet. And that's why brothers and sisters, in the limited time that I have, I want to share with you some of the, the similarities between the character of Rasulullah and Lady Fatima alayhi salam. And I wanna, I wanna focus on three, three areas where we see great similarity between the Prophet and Lady Fatima alayhi salam. The first is with respect to their fervor and their passion for ibadah. You see that there is a similarity between the two. So they're similar in their ibadah. Number two, we will find that they are similar in their zuhd. Meaning in the same way that the Prophet was detached from this material world, Fatima to Zahra salam was also indifferent about the glitter and the glamour of this material world, of this earthly life. And then finally, the mercy, the love and the compassion of the Prophet. You know, we, we speak about how Rasulullah is rahmatan lil alameen, the love that the Prophet had for people, the compassion that he had, how soft-hearted Rasulullah was, you see the same characteristic in Lady Fatima. So we begin with the virtue of ibadah. You know in the Quran, if you look at Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals an ayah in the Quran the first three verses in Surah Taha. Surah Taha is the 20th Surah of the Quran where 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Taha, which is one of the names that Allah gave to the Prophet, Taha. You know, when someone is very beloved to you, you have nicknames for them. Taha, ma anzalna alayka al Quran litashqa. Taha, we did not send down the Quran for you to be miserable, for you to suffer. Do you know why this ayah was revealed? This verse was revealed because the Prophet he would stand in worship at night for so many hours that his feet became swollen. He was he had so much love for Allah Azza wa Jalla that you know even the way that he would perform Salatul Layl is described. So you know Salatul Layl is 11 rak'ah. The Prophet in the beginning of the night he would pray two rak'ah and he would sleep for a period of time. And then he would wake up, do wudu and pray another two rak'ah. And then he would sleep and then he would wake up again. He had this type of love relationship with Allah. You know when you when you're in love with someone, especially those who are you know, newly engaged, you know, they call their fiancé, and then they hang up, and then what happens after 5, 10, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, they call again. You know, I just wanted to hear your voice again. MashaAllah, how romantic, right? And then hang up. And then what? 15 minutes later, you call again. Why? What is this called? This is called love. This is how you express love. It's almost like, like a teasing game. That lovers, they tease each other. Then the Prophet goes, he prays, and then he comes back to sleep. Back and forth. And he would do this the entire night. Until it started to take a toll on his physical health. His, his feet became swollen. So Allah Azza wa Jal has to tell the Prophet, Take it easy, Ya Rasulullah. That you don't need to spend the entire night. Yes, you have this love for me, but your body has limitations. Your body has limitations. Your soul wants to be close to me, but your body, you have to respect the limits of your body. So Allah Azza wa Jal, can you imagine you know, with us, Allah has to motivate us to, do, to worship. With the Prophet, Allah has to tell him to take it easy. It's the opposite. And you see, subhanAllah, the exact same description in Fatima to Zahra. You know, Hassan, and this is not, this is a statement from Hassan al-Basri. You know, Hassan al-Basri is not Shia. He is one of the tabi'een, he is one of the second generation Muslims, and he is, he is seen as one of the icons of spirituality in the Sunni world. Look at his description of Lady Fatima. He says, مَا كَانَ فِي هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ أَعْبَدُ مِنْ فَاطِمَةِ Hassan al-Basri, he says, there is no one who is a greater worshipper in this ummah. Out of all of these hundreds of thousands of sahaba, there is no one who excelled in worship more than Fatima. And then he says, She would stand in worship until until her feet became swollen exactly like the prophet now why is that you know i give this example all the time the only way that you can willingly stand can you imagine how long you have to stand for your feet to become swollen believe me if you stand for two hours your feet won't be swollen. It, they might be sore, but they won't become swollen. Can you imagine how many hours 
And, and they're, they're not wearing shoes, obviously. The salah, they're barefoot. How many hours do you have to stand for your feet to become swollen? Can you just imagine? What would make someone stand that long? You have to be doing something that you're enjoying. You know, have you seen youth, not even youth, people who like video games? Especially if it's a video game that they enjoy or they're watching a movie that they like. Sometimes you can see someone, if they're, if they're really into the video game, Wallah, they can cross their legs and sit without moving for three hours. I've seen it. Sometimes you see some of these youth, they're playing... I don't know what these, the games are these days that they play. I've, I'm out of touch. But the point is that if you love something, you'll, you'll sit there and you won't move for hours. And when do you notice that your feet, you can't feel your feet? When the game is finished. When you hit the, you turn off the video game console and you, you try to stand up and then you fall because your feet are numb. But while you were playing, you didn't feel anything because you're enjoying it. Rasulullah enjoys the prayer. Why do they enjoy it? Because they know who they're speaking to. Fatima to Zara, why do they enjoy Salah? Because they know who Allah is. You and I, we don't know who Allah is. You know, we act as though we're leaving Allah a message. There, you, know, you know, sometimes you leave a message on someone's phone, you leave a voicemail. We talk to Allah as if we're not really speaking to Him, we're just leaving a message. And that's why in the salah, we're constantly reminding ourselves that no, you're not leaving a message, you're actually speaking directly to Allah, and Allah is listening to every word that you're uttering. That's why when you raise your head from ruku', what do you say? Sami Allahu liman hamida. That Allah hears those who praise Him. Because salah is such a routine, we just say it, and it's as though we're just leaving a message. There's no soul in the prayer. There's no spirit. So this was her ibadah. And you know what's interesting? Fatima to Zahra enjoyed her nawafil so much that after she had Fatim, after she had Hassan and Hussein and Zainab, you know, for those of you who have children, you know, your life becomes upside down when you have children. You don't have time for anything anymore. Yes? I see some of the parents that are smiling. They know the reality. After Hassan and Hussein, you can imagine that Fatima to Zara had a lot of work to do in the house. She has to take care of these children. There are a lot of domestic chores to do. It's not like today where you have a washing machine and you have a dishwasher. It was, it was a lot of work. There was no minute rice or anything. Everything was manual labor. So when Hassan and Hussein, when Fatima to Zara got married and she had children, you can imagine that she did not have the same amount of time that she did before to do these nawafil. So Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen had a suggestion for her. He says to her that why don't you ask Rasulullah to give you a maid, a servant, who can help you with the domestic chores, so this will free up your time for ibadah. So she goes and she asks for a servant. And the Prophet sallallahu says, Ya Fatima, I'll give you something. You want a servant? I'll give you something that is better than the servant. And I'll give you something that is even better than the world and everything in it. What does he teach you? He says, after your obligatory prayers, recite Allahu Akbar 34 times. Subhanallah 33 times and Alhamdulillah 33 times. This was taught to Fatima to Zahra as a way to compensate 
for the time that she didn't have anymore to perform those extra prayers. Now you may say that why didn't the Prophet just give her the maid so she can for focus on prayer? Rasulullah wants us to be balanced people. That the household chores that we think are taking us away from ibadah is actually a form of ibadah. It's good for your soul to do these household chores. It keeps you humble. It's good to do things for other, for your family members, to cook for your family, to clean for your family. There's tawab in this for men and for women. That's why Amir al muminin used to also sweep in the house. It's a type of khidmah for your family. On one occasion, the Prophet comes to the house of Ali and Fatima at night. And he tells Fatima, you know, he used to always give her spiritual tips. One night the Prophet came and he said to Fatima to Zahra that, Ya Bunayya Fatima, O oh my daughter, do not go to bed unless you perform Hajj and Umrah, unless you recite the entire Quran, unless you please all of the Mu'mineen, and unless you gain the Shafa'ah of all the Prophets. So the Prophet said this and then he stood in the Mihrab and started praying. Fatima to Zahra, she wondered, how can I, how can I do this every night? Hajj is only one time in the year and Umrah requires me to... How can I do this every single night? So she says, I waited for the Prophet to finish his Salah. And I asked him, Ya Rasulullah, you told me something strange. That I could gain all of these rewards every single night. How can I do this? He says, every night before you go to sleep. And believe me. If there's anything that you take away from tonight's lecture, it's just this. Something that will take you less than one minute to do every night before you sleep. He says, number one, before you sleep, say subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. At tasbihat al arba'ah. Just once. If you do that and you're conscious of what you're saying, Allah will give you the reward of a mustahab hajj and umrah. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's looking for excuses to give you paradise. Allah just says, do something so I can reward you. Number two, recite Surah Qul Hu Allahu Ahad three times. And you receive the thawab of reciting the entire Quran. Why three times? Surah Al Ikhlas is about Tawheed. If you look at the Quran from cover to cover, one third of the Quran focuses on Tawheed. So read it three times. Now the third one sounds very difficult. How can I make all of the Mu'mineen and all of the Mu'minat happy with me? Some people can't even make the people who are in their household happy with them. How can I? It's very difficult to please people. Rasulullah says every night, say before you sleep, Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. Oh Allah, forgive the believing men and the believing women. If you do this, on the Day of Judgment, they'll be pleased that you prayed for them. Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. And the fourth, if you want to earn the shafa'a of all of the Prophets, what do you do? You say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad wa ala jami' al-anbiya wal mursal. And with this, you earn the intercession of all of the, the messengers and the prophets. You see, brothers and sisters, there was this thirst to gain nearness to Allah. And believe me, sometimes we think attaining nearness to Allah is some impossible feat. It's not. Every Thursday night, in Dua Kumail, what do we recite? Ya Sari Arrida. Allah, oh, the one who is quickly pleased. Believe me, maybe that night you recite those four things, 
And that is the night that you pass away. What a beautiful way to return to Allah. Such a simple action that has such a great reward. So this is with respect to her ibadah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now when it comes to her, her zuhd, her simplicity, her indifference to this material world. You know, brothers and sisters, one of the greatest problems that we have is that we're too obsessed with things. Right. You know, if you go on social media, most of us, we spend so much time on social media just looking at what people have. The type of clothes that they wear, the cars that they have, the vacations that they go to. And we measure our lives against theirs. Our standard for success is what? How much of dunya you have? How much money you have? What type of clothes you wear? What type of car do you drive? How many square feet does your house, is your house? That's what we focus on. We're very money driven. Everything that we do, in fact, we choose our career based on what's going to get us the most money. Right. We buy brand name clothes because it makes us feel good, it makes us feel prominent. Almost every decision that we make is dunya we based. Allah is not in the equation. For example, we'll buy a house if it's in a very affluent neighborhood, but we won't ask ourselves, is there a masjid that's nearby? <coughs> That means that everything about our decision-making is about dunya. Now if you look at Fatima, you know, Fatima al-Zahra is not just the daughter of the Prophet. She is the daughter of the most powerful man in Arabia. She is the daughter of the head of state. You know, Rasulullah wasn't just a Prophet. He was the head of a government. Which means what? He had access to unlimited wealth. Do you think if the Prophet wanted to live lavishly, he couldn't? He could have lived very lavishly. In fact, there's a hadith from Imam al-Baqir to give you an idea of how simple the Prophet was. You know, when you look at kings and prime ministers and presidents, usually we only find out how much money they had after they die. Right? That's when you find out how much they were stealing. Right? You know, they live in palaces, but you don't really know how much they have until they die and someone else inherits it. You know, you look at Qadhafi. When he died, that's when they figured out, oh my God, you thought Bill Gates was the richest guy in the world? This guy was hoarding billions, if not trillions of dollars. And they all speak in the name of God, in the name of Islam. The question is, so you know some people, they, you might think they live simply, but they're hiding, they're hiding money. Imam al-Baqir, he talks about what the Prophet left behind of his own property when he died. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, إِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ لَمْ يُوَرِّثْ دِينَارًا وَلَا دِرْهَمًا The Prophet, when he died, did not leave behind a single gold coin or a single silver coin. There was no money. وَلَا وَلِيدَةً وَلَا شَاتًا وَلَا بَعِيرًا He did not leave a sheep, a camel, he left nothing. The only thing that he owned that he had, that belonged to him, that was his property on the day that he died, was one thing. Imam al-Baqir mentions, وَلَقَدْ قُبِضَ وَإِنَّ دِرْعَهُ مَرْهُونَةٌ عِنْدَ يَهُودِيٍ مَنْ يَهُودِ الْمَدِينَةِ بِعِشْرِينَ صَاعًا مِنْ شَعِيرٍ The Prophet left only his shield. And after the Prophet died, they took his shield to the market, they sold it, and they gathered 20 dirhams that they used to buy barley. 
and they gave it to his family. That's the Prophet. In fact, you know Amir al-Mu'mineen, when he died, when he was martyred, he was the Khalifa. You know, you look at what others did before him. When Amir al-Mu'mineen died, he tells Imam al-Hassan that I want you to pay my debt. Have you ever seen a ruler of a country who dies and not only do they not have any money, but they have debt? Question, why does Amir al-Mu'mineen have debt? Do you know why he has debt? What is this debt for? Was he buying real estate? Did he buy a penthouse in Syria? Why does the Imam have debt? You know why he has debt? Because Ali ibn Abi Talib, if he doesn't have money to help people, he'll take out a loan to help people. Can you imagine that? What kind? Have you ever, do you know anyone that takes out a loan and gives it to someone else. Now, if you have excess money, you might give a portion of it. You have nothing, you take a loan that you will pay back, and you give that money to someone. That's Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this is why Imam Amir al Mu'mineen loved Fatima, because Fatima to Zara was the same. There were many times where Amir al Mu'mineen would come home. And he would ask for some dinner, some food. Fatima to Zahra, she says, Ya Abel Hassan, there's no food in the house. He says to her, O oh daughter of the Prophet, why didn't you tell me that there's no food? She says, because I don't want to burden you. That you're busy defending Islam. You have more important things. That we can, we can live off of this, the simple provisions that we have. Jabir ibn Abdullah, and you know, if you look at, look at the daughters of many of the, the kings and the presidents, and look at how they live. And you don't need to go, look at down south, the daughter of the president. Oh, the, the access to wealth and how lavishly they live, how they steal public funds, how they enrich themselves. And then you look at the people that Allah chose to be our role models. Jabir ibn Abdullah, he says, I was with the Prophet when we visited the house of Fatima. رأى النبي فاطمة وعليها كساء من أجلة الإب. The Prophet saw Fatima one day, and she was wearing simple clothes, clothes that were from the skin of a camel. It was very low quality clothes. It wasn't that she was wearing silk or fine garments. وَهِيَ تَطْحَنُ بِيَدِهَا You know, brothers and sisters, you and I, if we want bread, what do we do? Unless you're old school, you don't bake bread at home, right? You go where? You go to Savon, you go to Superstore, and you buy bread, and that's it, finished. You know, back in, the, back in the day, you know what they used to do? They used to grind wheat. If you've ever grinded wheat, it's a very difficult process. You have to first grind the wheat and then you can start preparing to bake the bread. Fatima to Zahra would do it herself until her hands became swollen. This is the daughter of the Prophet. This is how simple she was. She used to nurse her own children. You know, many wealthy families, what would they do? The women, they would give the child to someone else to nurse. She would do it herself. When the Prophet saw how simple his daughter's life was, he started to cry. And he said to her that, O oh Fatima, you will gain the sweetness of the Akhirah if you continue to endure the bitterness of this life. And this is why people were comfortable around Fatima to Zahra. You know, sometimes when you hang around rich people, they kind of make you feel inferior to them. You know, they kind of rub their wealth in your face. They make you feel that you don't belong. But everyone felt comfortable around Fatima to Zahra. Whether you were rich or poor, 
There was something very magnetic about her. And this brings me to the third quality, which is her love. Can you imagine what type of person you have to be to be a rahma to the one who was rahmatan lil alameen? You know, the Prophet is a mercy to the worlds. Everyone comes to the Prophet when they have problems, right? But the question is, where does the Prophet go when he feels distressed? He goes to Fatima. This is what the Prophet means when he says, Fatima, Ummu Abiha. When he felt physical weakness, when he felt distress, even in Hadith Al Kisa, what does he say? Ya Fatima, inni ajidu fi badani lafa. When he would feel weakness, when he would feel distress, he doesn't go to any of his wives. He goes to Fatima. Because Fatima gives him something that no one can give him. And that is that spiritual comfort. The other wives might give him food. They might give him the material sustenance. But Rasulullah craves the company of the spiritual elite. Now, many of you have heard the story about that night when Imam al-Hasan when, when he was a young child. The narration is from Imam al-Sadiq and he says that Imam al-Hasan says, رَأَيْتُ أُمِّي فَاطِمَا قَامَتْ فِي مِحْرَابِهَا لَيْلَةَ جُمْعَةً Imam al-Hasan, he says, and he was a young boy, he says, on Thursday night, it's a blessed night. He says, I woke up and I saw my mother standing in her mihrab. She would, especially Thursday night, she would spend the entire night in worship. فَلَمْ تَزَلْ رَاكِعَةً وَسَاجِدَ حَتَّى فَجَرَ عَمُودُ الصُّبْحِ She was bowing and prostrating until the time of Fajr. But this is not the most amazing part of the narration. He says, وَسَمِعْتُهَا تَدْعُوا لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ I heard her praying for the believers, the men and the women. But you know, brothers and sisters, there are two ways to pray for mu'mineen and mu'minat. You know, just like the way that you and I do it, many of us were too lazy. We just say, oh Allah, forgive the mu'mineen and the mu'minat. That's it. But Imam al-Hasan, he says, تَدْعُوا لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَتُسَمِّيهِمْ وَتُسَمِّيهِمْ She would mention their names. She would mention the names one by one. Can you imagine how much how much love you have to have in your heart? You spend hours and you're mentioning this person in your salah by name. And Imam al Hassan says, It's not that she just says, Oh Allah, forgive Abu Dhar. No, no, no. She mentions Abu Dhar and she thinks of all of the problems that Abu Dhar might have and she prays for each and every one of those things. She makes a detailed, heartfelt dua for each person, one by one. فَقُلْتُ يَا لِمَ لَا تَدْعِينَ لِنَفْسِكِ I hear you mentioning all of these people one by one and you don't pray for yourself and then what does she say in that famous line Bunay al jar thumm al-dar you know this is easy for us to talk about it's easy for us to read this hadith and say masha allah subhanallah but how many of us actually practice this and this is how you get rid of hasad. You know, sometimes we have hasad against people who are envious. If you're envious of someone, and sometimes you can't help it, you're a jealous person, the way that you remedy the spiritual diseases in your salah, mention them by name. And ask Allah to give them rizq, to give them health, to protect them. You have to mention them in your salah. And Fatima to Zahra, you know, in the battle of of Uhud, 
And the battle, the battle of Uhud was a battle where there was, it was a devastating loss to the Muslims. And the Prophet was injured in that battle. He, his front teeth broke. His face was covered in blood. Many of the Muslims were injured. Ibn Abi al-Hadid al-Mu'tazili, who is the, is a Sunni scholar who wrote a commentary on Nahjul Balagha. He mentions that in the battle of Uhud, because there were so many wounded soldiers, Fatima to Zahra, along with 13 women from Medina, they went to the battlefield. They left their houses in Medina carrying bread and water on their shoulders. Now, I don't know about you, brothers and sisters. You can only imagine how much water they were carrying across the deserts and the food that they were carrying on their backs. Because the men, for the battle, they took all of the horses and all of the camels. So the women on foot, they carried these provisions to the battlefield. Fatima was with them. Fatima to Salah didn't say that I'm the daughter of the Prophet. You know, let's give it to the slaves. Let them go and deliver the aid. Fatima to Zahra was leading them. And, you know, and this shows you that modesty doesn't have to inhibit your activity in the community. They go and Fatima to Zahra and the 14 women, they tend to the wounds of the soldiers. Now, one final comment that I, that I want to make is related to, to Fedak. You know, brothers and sisters, when we speak about Fatima to Zahra, we often mention Fedak. But many of us, we don't really understand what Fedak is all about. We think that it's this land that was stolen from Fatima to Zahra, and that's the extent of it. We associate it with a type of oppression. But what is Fedak? And why is it important? We know that in the seventh year after the Hijrah, Rasulullah through the heroics of Ali ibn Abi Talib, they conquered the fortress of Khaybar, which was a Jewish fortress. Now, when they conquered Khaybar, the Jews, they had settlements nearby. One of those settlements was Fedak. Fedak was a nearby village. Now when the Jews of Medina heard that Fedak was conquered, you can imagine that scared them because Fedak is our strong, uh, Khaybar is our stronghold. So what did they do? They offered Fedak to the Prophet as a settlement that, you know, don't fight us, take this land of Fedak. In Surah Al-Hashd, Surah 59, Ayah number 6, Allah says that any territory that is acquired by Muslims without military conflict is the sole property of the Prophet. So any territory that the Muslims conquer using their military force, it belongs to all Muslims. It's public property. But any land that is gained without military conflict is the sole property of Rasulullah. It's mentioned in the Quran. So Fedak belongs to the Prophet. Yes? After Fedak comes under the control of the Prophet, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals Surah Al Isra, ayah number 26. And give your nearest kin, their right. Jibra'il comes. Rasulullah says, what is the meaning of this ayah? Who is the qurba and what is their right? Jibra'il says, give Fedak to Fatima. Give Fedak to Fatima. So Rasulullah goes to Fatima and he says, Oh my daughter, Allah has commanded me to give you Fedak. Fatima to Zara says, Ya Rasulullah, what will I do with Fedak? The Prophet says to her, 
It's for you and your children. You know, when we know Ahlul Bayt, they don't care about dunya. Why did Allah command the Prophet to give Fadak to Fatima? We know that in the Quran there's a surah called Surat Al Munafiqun, the surah of the hypocrites. There were many hypocrites in Medina who pretended to be Muslim but were actually enemies of the Prophet. In fact, some Mufassireen they say that at minimum one third of those who were around the Prophet were Munafiqeen. After the death of the Prophet, what happened to them? Did, they, did the earth swallow them? Did they fly to the heavens? What happened to them? They were still there. They were still there. The Munafiqeen were still there. When the first Khalifa comes to power, the first order of business, two days after Saqifa, they confiscate Fadak. Fadak was transferred to Fatima during the life of the Prophet. She was managing Fadak during the life of the Prophet. She hired gardeners and farmers. It was under her control. After the death of the Prophet, two days after Saqifa, they capture, they confiscate Fadak. Why? The Ahadith mention that Fadak used to generate between 25,000 dinars to 250 dinars per year. It was under the control of Fatima for four years. In the last year, because she developed it, it generated 250,000 dinars. The revenue generated by Fedek was astronomical. When the first Khalifa confiscated it and Fatima gave the sermon, he was about to give it back to her because he had no argument. Because Um Ayman, the Prophet's foster mother, gave testimony that it belonged to Fatima. Asma bint Umais, who was the wife of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, who was the wife of Abu Bakr. Can you imagine? The wife of Abu Bakr testified that Fatima was given Fadak and she owned it during the lifetime of the Prophet. Imam, Imam Amir al muminin testified, Hassan and Hussein. And usually when something is under your control, you know, as they say, possession is nine-tenths of the law. If I'm sitting in my house and you come into my house and you say, this house is mine. Who needs, to, who needs to provide evidence? Me or you? You do. It's in my possession. Abu Bakr was about to sign over, to give an executive order to give Fadak back to Fatima. The second Khalifa, what did he say? And this is the line that I want you to remember. He says, how will we fund the army? Do you know what this means? Fedek was producing so much money that it could fund a military budget. That's how much money was being generated. Now the question is, why, why was it given to Fatima? It was given to Fatima for the same reason that Allah gave Yahya to Zakaria. Zakaria was worried that after his death, his corrupt relatives would use their wealth, the wealth that they would inherit from him, and corrupt the religion of Allah. Fadak was given to Fatima to fund the propagation of Islam after the Prophet, because Rasulullah knew that they will not have a government, and Fedek was supposed to be the parallel government to fund the mission of Amir al muminin and the Imams after them. And I'll end with one, this one final statement, that look at the beauty of the way that Allah works. Allah decreed that the wealth of Khadija 
would fund Nubuwa, and he also decreed that the wealth of Fatima through Fadak would fund the mission of Imama. We ask Allah Azza wa to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin.